Good morning. Good morning. It is a beautiful and a wonderful thing to be gathered here together this morning. I say that every Sunday. I mean it every Sunday. I'm not being repetitious or, or just saying it because it's what preachers should say at the beginning of a lesson. It really, really thrills me to see my brothers and my sisters coming together to worship God in spirit and in truth, to serve Him, to encourage one another, and most importantly, to remember His death, burial, and resurrection in partaking of the Lord's Supper. As we get into our lesson this morning, we're going to be talking about the cost of discipleship. The cost of discipleship. I'll have a PowerPoint this morning, but it's not going to include our verses. I'll ask you to turn in your Bibles with me. We're going to exercise our fingers today. Mark chapter 10. If you turn to Mark chapter 10. We have a familiar passage here, beginning in verse 17. The story that your, your Bible might have a heading telling you that we're going to talk about the rich young ruler. That's what we're going to start with this morning. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, Mark 10 beginning in verse 17, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and began asking him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. And looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go and sell all you possess and give to the poor. And you shall have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But at these words his face fell, and he went away grieved, for he was one who owned much property. I'm reading this morning out of the New American Standard. So we have this short little story of a man who comes up and, and has this encounter, this interaction with Jesus, the Anointed One. He comes up to him and he asks what he needs to do to inherit eternal life. So one of the things that uh, we can pull out of this and one of the things that we can understand to shape our, our character understanding of, of this rich young ruler, he was probably a Jew or maybe a proselyte, but he was probably a practicing Jew because when he asks what he should do to inherit eternal life, uh, Jesus says, you know the commandments. So Jesus took it as fact that this guy was a Jew or knew the Jewish law. That's confirmed in his response in verse 20 when he says, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. He grew up knowing the law. He grew up practicing the law. And he grew up to be such a one that when Jesus was talking to him and tells him to do these things, and he says, I've kept all these things from my youth up, Jesus didn't laugh. I think it's worth noting that Jesus took him seriously when he said that he'd kept all these things from his youth up. This was a, and I'm going to break uh, Jesus' own rule here. This was what we might call basically a good person. This is somebody who was abiding by the law from his youth up. He was raised to know the old law. And he was keeping the old law. So the first thing I want us uh, to notice about what Jesus says to him is what we're told about how Jesus says it to him. Jesus hears that he's kept the law from his youth up, and looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him. That word in the Greek there is the same that we get compassion. When it talks about Jesus looking on someone and having compassion for them, he felt deeply for them. He was concerned for them and for their well-being, especially their, their soul, their spiritual well-being. He saw this man and he loved him. I want us to think for a minute as we look at his answer about what the world wants us to think and what denominations want us to think and what various Christians of, of any caliber want us to think it means to love somebody. 
If you come up to me and you say, I want to know what I need to be doing to inherit eternal life. If I love you and I know that there's something you lack, if I'm trying to be like Jesus, I'll tell you. Jesus doesn't, it doesn't say that Jesus looking at him felt a love for him and said, I know you're doing your best. Just keep on keeping on. That's not his answer. He loved him and out of that love, he said, this is what's missing. This is what you need to do. And notice in all the study that I've, I've done on this, and, and I'm open if this is wrong, but I haven't found a place in the Old Testament yet that tells him, no place in the law that tells this young ruler to have sold all his possessions and give to the poor. That's something that Jesus saw he had a need to do. That wasn't something he could have discerned from knowing the law, from knowing the oral traditions that had been passed down from rabbi to rabbi to rabbi throughout, throughout the years. This wasn't something he could have deduced from the law. This is something Jesus saw that he needed to do because he saw and knew him and felt a love for him. We see, of course, that he, his face fell, his countenance had fallen, and he went away grieved, for he owned much. This is an interesting passage because we talk about the application and, and we jump to the... The fact, and I think it's true, that no, God is not saying that if you want to be a Christian, you have to sell everything that you own. I don't think that's what he's saying. He saw that that was a stumbling block, something that would come between this rich young ruler and his walk with God. And he said, you need to make sure that that doesn't come between you. And he says, sell all your possessions in the same way that he tells somebody whose right eye or right hand is causing them to stumble and keeping them out of the kingdom to pluck it out or cut it off. Because it's keeping you out, and it's better to lose that thing, whether it's a body part, or your money, or your possessions, or whatever it is. It's better for you to lose that and gain heaven than to keep all of your worldly comforts and miss heaven. So we look at that, and I want us to have that kind of attitude in our minds that God calls His disciples to give things up from time to time. Expressly, anything that will keep us in sin or keep us out of the kingdom. And we'll look at some passages as we go on this morning that will talk about who will not inherit the kingdom. But before we get into that, I want us to look at another passage in Luke. If we turn over to Luke, the 14th chapter. Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 25, Jesus is in his ministry here and people are flocking to him. Great multitudes were going along with him. It tells us here at the beginning of Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Great multitudes were going along with him and he turned around and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and take counsel whether he is strong enough with 10,000 to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while there is, excuse me, or else while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks terms of peace. So therefore, no one of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. This is another equally challenging passage to that of the, the rich young ruler because of the precedent that it sets. It shows us the, expect, the expectation that God has that if we are going to be His disciples, that there is nothing that we can hold on to. There's nothing that we can say is too important for us to give up for the cause of Christ. Think about your life and think about the things in your life, the, the parts of your life that might otherwise keep you from heaven. Heaven. 
Think about, think about the, the work that you do. Think about the things that you have, the places that you go, the, the hobbies and the things that you enjoy doing. Those are good things. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I guess I don't know all of your hobbies and things you do for fun. But it's okay. It's okay for, for a man to enjoy the fruits of his labor. The, the Bible's clear on that. It's okay to, to be rich. We're told to be careful about being rich. But it is okay to be rich. Money is just an inanimate object. It's what you do with it. It's okay. It's good to have jobs. If you don't work, you don't deserve to eat, as even the New Testament plainly states. It's fine to have these things. But we get to a point sometimes in our lives where that's all we care about. Or we get to points in our lives when we know that we should be doing more for the kingdom, but we're not going to give up X, Y, or Z. I want us to challenge that this morning. I want us to, to think about what Jesus is saying in this passage. He, he says, and, and I'll clarify what he's saying here in verse 26, when he says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. There's a couple of things I want to point out here. First of all, when he says hate, people who want to uh, discredit the Bible might turn to this passage and say, See, you say it's all about love, but Jesus says you have to hate everybody. If you want to be his disciple, he's not talking about despising or wishing ill on anyone. He's saying to love them less. Be willing to sacrifice your earthly relationships. Be willing to give up your family ties. Be willing to give up your friendships and your neighbors and any other relationship that you might have to follow Christ. There's a saying, and, and we we get it wrong. I'll explain what I mean. We say that the blood of the or blood is thicker than water, right? And so we, we think that that means that my family ties are more important than anybody's hospitality, anybody who gives me water. But that's only part of the saying. The saying is actually that the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. So it is making exactly the opposite point. The blood of the covenant, the blood by which we are purchased, is thicker, is more important, has more gravity in our lives than any of our family ties born through the water of the womb. Something else I want to point out here in verse 26. There's a word that you see a lot in that one verse. It's a simple word. It's and. And there's a, a figure of speech that I'll tell you about, and I'll, I'll bring this up from time to time, and you'll usually notice in the way that I read a passage. But if a passage has a lot of ands, especially very close together, it's called a polysyndeton. There's not a test on that. It just means that there's a lot of ands. Poly, sin, sin being an or with or, or something like that, and, and deten, denoting that it's relating to those things. So a lot of ands, right? So if we... What that means is that as we go through the list of ands, each and blank is its own climactic point. Okay? So when we read this, we might read it, and we might do well to read it, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters and even his own life he cannot be my disciple by emphasizing it that way we're we're showing and understanding that there is equal emphasis on each of the relationships that we need to be willing to uh, to remove ourselves from for the cause of Christ this is a hard thing I know too many people, and I've been in this situation myself, having to remove myself from relationships, from friends, even physical blood family, for the cause of Christ. If I were not willing to do that, he says that I could not be his disciple. Do we understand the impact, the gravity of that statement? If you do not do this, you cannot be my disciple. You can say and claim anything that you like, and there are many who do. There are many who do claim to be followers of Christ, who claim to be disciples. But they don't meet these descriptions. If I will not carry my own cross, 
and follow him. I cannot be his disciple. If I do not give up, if I am not willing to give up all my possessions, I cannot be his disciple. If you want to be God's disciple, we need to consider that there is a cost. There is a price that we have to be willing and ready to accept. So with that said, I want us to think about a a few different elements of this. First of all, we need to ask the question, does it apply to me today? And we need to ask this question because often the assumption is no. Often the assumption is we get to a hard passage in Scripture and deliberately or otherwise because of habit or what we've been taught, whatever. I'm not bashing that. There's just this tendency. It's a pernicious tendency that we have to say, he didn't mean that. Or he's not being literal. Or he's talking to them in that culture. It meant something more important to the Jews than it did for us today in 2018 America. I want to challenge that. And I want you to challenge that. I want you to think about why there should be an exception today for the need to count the cost. If he plainly says things that are pretty generic and then follows them up with, you cannot be my disciple. I don't see any kind of timeline on that. I don't see any kind of cultural implication there. There's maybe some special cultural significance that we can appreciate in saying that the Jews who converted to Christianity were rejected and thrown out of their families and their economies. They had to be willing to suffer that. But so do some today. Maybe not to the same scale or degree, but people do today. For other reasons, we might need to be separated. We need to be willing to do that. It's part of the cost we need to count. We also need to consider that we're called to be crucified. All disciples are called to be crucified with Christ. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after him cannot be his disciple. You don't carry a cross because it's a fun thing to do. It's not just a a tool or something that you relocate from one place to another. It's an instrument of death. In Galatians 2 and verse 20, Paul recognizes that he has been crucified with Christ. We should share that. We should recognize, like we're told in in Romans chapter 6, that we are buried, we are dead to the old man, and we rise to walk in newness of life. We're a new creature. We need to understand that that applies today as much as it did in the first century. We don't use the term disciples as much anymore. But I want us to understand something about the nature of being a disciple. First of all, it very simply means that it, it's very similar to somebody who follows a certain discipline. Right? That's the, the root word that we're working on. If you're a disciple, you're a follower. But it's more than that. There's something in the Jewish culture, and you, you see a lot of talk in the New Testament about rabbis. You see, they, they all knew the law. Every, every decent Jew knew the law pretty much backwards and front by the time they were 13. That was their culture. That was what they impressed on their children. And that is a wonderful thing that we should bring into modern society. We should teach our children as well. I don't think they need to have the the law memorized, but they need to know their Bible. But that said, they knew the law, but they didn't necessarily know what it said about minute details. Okay, I know the law says to tithe this, to grow this, to to plant this, to give this. I know it says to do these things. But what does that mean about how much sugar I can put in my coffee? Right? The daily living kind of things that the law doesn't seem to be very specific on. That's why there were rabbis. Rabbis were the people that you went to to ask for those very specific meanings. That's what they did. You would go to your rabbi and say, Rabbi, I know that it says this. What can I do in this situation? You see a lot of that kind of questioning directed at Jesus in his life, usually as a challenge or a test to try to trip him up. Teacher, in this situation, what's the ruling according to the law? So on and so forth. So you would would find a rabbi that you trusted, and you would be a disciple of that rabbi. That was no small thing. That wasn't you went to... Uh, their meeting place on the Sabbath and and heard their lesson. That's not all it was to be a disciple. If you were a disciple, it was a very special few people 
who literally followed the rabbi around every day to the point that they, if the rabbi had a lisp or some kind of speech impediment, his disciples would imitate that and they would adopt that. If he limped, they would change the way that they walked so that they could imitate more perfectly their rabbi, the one whose disciple they were. So if Jesus here in Luke chapter 14 is qualifying who can be his disciple, he's talking about the multitudes going along with him, as we see in verse 25, who were following him everywhere that he went, who were striving to imitate him and know the things that he taught and the way that he taught and, the, and, and to know this new law that's coming down from heaven through Jesus. They want to know that, so they're following him. And he says, okay, you can, you can hang out, but you're not my disciple unless... So if we ask the question, should we be disciples today? Should we call ourselves disciples today? First of all, I think absolutely we should. It's in Acts chapter 11 and verse 26 that tells us that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Right? And so it's not that they changed the nature of what they were. It's that there was a new name that became more common. Just as we're the same as the way, but it's changed names over the centuries. It's changed what we've been known by. So also, those who call themselves Christians also ought to identify as disciples. We need to be those who, who imitate Christ. We see that imperative given in Ephesians chapter 5 in verse 1, just one place that it explicitly says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. I don't know how to put it more simply. We're to be imitators of God. We're to be disciples of God. So when we look at the qualifications, if you will, of disciples as set forth by Jesus in Luke chapter 14 and by what he told the, uh, the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10 and his parallel accounts, you know, we, we look at that. We need to be imitators of God. Those things still apply today because we are still disciples. So, yes, in 2018, we need to count the cost when we contemplate our walk with God. We need to count the cost and consider if this commitment that we've made to God is really one that we intend to honor our entire life, or if when things get rough, we're going to be like the seed sown in the rocky soil that gets choked out or sown among the weeds that, that suffocates it and, and no longer exists. We need to be imitators today, and we are all called to be crucified. We are all called to count the cost. Something I want us to appreciate along these lines is the fact that our God counted the cost before all of this. He is a faithful high priest who has been tested in all things as we are. He's a, a merciful and faithful and compassionate high priest, right? We're told in Hebrews chapter 4. I want us to consider that this is another area in which he has counted the cost. He knows what he's done. First, let's consider a very familiar passage in Matthew. Matthew chapter 26. In Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 36, this is after Jesus has instituted the Lord's Supper. It says, Then Jesus came with him to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He's about to count the cost. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed because he counted the cost. He said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for an hour. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, thy will be done. He came again and found them sleeping. He left them again in verse 44 and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. 
He counted the cost. I'm not trying to present to you this morning that it's all of a sudden in Gethsemane that Jesus has counted the cost. He's counted the cost long before this. In fact, in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 35, Jesus says, quoting from the prophets, let's turn over there, I'd hate to misquote it. In Matthew chapter 13 and verse 35, he says, So that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. Jesus had counted the cost when he was still in the beginning with God, before all that had been made was made through him. He knew the cost, but he also dreaded the cost. There in the garden, he prayed three times, sweating, we're told in Luke's account, drops of blood. Because he knew the cost. But he paid the price. He paid that cost. Having known it, having set out to understand what he was getting himself into, he did it anyway. He paid the price. And the question that I'm asking as we, as we go through and we understand that we need to count the cost, we understand that God counted the cost first and paid it. We need to understand that we're obligated to react to that. And everyone has a reaction to that. Either it's a fairy tale and doesn't matter to me. That's the reaction that unfortunately some have. Some have the reaction that we see in Acts chapter, I believe it's 7, when they plug up their ears and stomp their feet and yell and rush at Stephen and drag him out of the city and stone him. That's a reaction to this fact. Everybody reacts to this. How should we? How are you reacting to this? When Jesus paid this cost, when he counted this cost and decided to pay it, he had an expectation. If you'll turn with me to Hebrews, the ninth chapter. Hebrews, the ninth chapter. We could really take the whole chapter here, but we'll just take a chunk. We'll start in verse 11, and we'll read through verse 16. In Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 11, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. That's what this cost afforded, eternal redemption. He goes on, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason... He is the mediator of a new covenant in order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. He goes on to explain that principle, but again in reinforcing the cost. The price that Jesus paid for us, becoming flesh, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, so that our consciences would be cleansed from dead works to serve the living God, as we see in verse 14. Also, so that those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. This is what he afforded for us. This is what he paid for. This is what he extends to us. Eternal life. Eternal inheritance. He's given that to us. He expects us, first of all, to accept it. But he also expects us to walk worthy of the calling. Let's go back to Ephesians 5. After he tells us to be imitators of God as beloved children, he goes on to explain what that would look like. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, picking up in verse 2 then, he says, And walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. 
That's what we're expected to do with our lives. He goes on, Do not let immorality or any impurity or greed even be named among you as is proper among saints. There must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. We're going to talk about one more archaic figure of speech. There in, in verse 4, we see, well, really verses 3 through 4, we see what's called a not but statement, where basically we see the formula is not this, but that. And even though there's more words behind the not, there's more impact and there's more meaning and more significance behind the, the but, behind the to the contrary or but rather. In fact, usually when I come across this figure, if I'm, if I'm reading to you, I might paraphrase, paraphrase and add rather if it's not there already. Because that's what's being emphasized. Yes, it's important that we do not let immorality or any impurity or greed be named among us. It's important that there be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting because it's not fitting for the saints. That's absolutely true and correct and we need to teach that and practice that. But what's more important to our Christian walk, what's more important to the way that we walk in love, as he says in verse 2, is the giving of thanks. That's the response that we ought to ultimately have to the fact that He gave Himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a pleasing aroma. Our, our response to God's counting the cost and paying it should be gratitude. That's what we owe Him. That's what we owe Him. So then it's natural to ask the question, how do I go about counting the cost and what does it mean for me? What do I actually have to do? Is it just a mental exercise to say, would I be willing to give up this, that, or another thing? Well, I think that's the first part of it. I think the first part of counting the cost is examining yourself and your life and asking the question, what threatens your walk with God? What is it that stands to come between you and God? Is it an attitude of, of jealousy or of pride? In which case you need to hear the words of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, having this mind in you that was also in Christ. Is it your family that you just can't pull yourself away from to go and be with the saints? Is it your family that you put as more important than your, your spiritual obligations or than your spiritual family? You need to remember what Jesus tells people who want to be his disciples in Luke chapter 14. Is it any other worldly pleasure? There's a pretty detailed and all-inclusive list here in Ephesians chapter 5. From filthiness and silly talk and coarse jesting to uh, immorality and impurity and covetousness and idolatry. Uh, having no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God, empty words and being deceived and disobedience and, and walking in darkness and so on and so forth. You can go through and you can see a pretty extensive list of what we need to avoid so that we can be living thankful and grateful lives. We can go on with those things, but that's a challenge for you today. We talk about counting the cost, and, and I present this lesson uh, in some form to anyone who tells me that they want to be baptized. And I encourage you to at least bring up the concept if you're at, approached by somebody who you study with and wants to be baptized. It's important that they count the cost. It's important that they understand that there are things that could disqualify them from being a disciple. For example, one of the, the things that we need to go through with people who are interested in the gospel and obeying the gospel is the importance of and the reality of repentance and the fact that you need to make your life right before you come to Christ that as best and as much as, you, as much as depends on you, that you repent and be baptized, that you are turning away from these things. If there's things that you're doing that are sinful that you're not willing to put away, don't set your hand to the plow knowing that you'll only turn back. Another passage in Hebrews, I believe the sixth chapter, tells us that it's worse for that one who knows and has tasted the goodness and the salvation of God and has still fallen away. He even tells us that it's impossible to restore somebody who has tasted salvation and turned from it. 
Let's prevent people from being in that situation. But as most of us here in the building today have already put on Christ, we've already made the decision to be His followers, I want you to ask, even retroactively, have you counted the cost? Do you know what it is and what it's costing you to commit your life to Christ? Because so many put on Christ in baptism or, or have that intention and still don't turn away from their sin. They haven't counted the cost. They haven't considered the fact that if they won't give up these things, that they are not disciples of Christ. What a terrible situation to find yourself in on Judgment Day. I don't want that for any of us. I don't want that for any soul. So as you count the cost, I want you to ask, as you come across these things that might come between you and God, will you give it up for eternal life? It's been said by probably several brethren that if you've missed heaven, you've missed it all. It's a worthy saying, a faithful saying. If there's something that you need to remove from your life this morning, if you need to count the cost in some way, or if you need the prayers or the help of the congregation, if anyone needs to be baptized and, and put him on for the first time, I pray that you count the cost and that you do all these things, but not hesitate. And do make that decision so that it will go well with you and so that we have hope of eternity in our life tomorrow. If you're subject to the invitation this morning, if you need to count the cost in any way, come forward as together we stand and sing.